Welcome to From the Quarries. If you're the sort of person who lies awake all night, tossing and turning, and worrying about brooch thernals and tassel boards, then this video is just for you. It's another anonymous talk from the Short Talk Bulletin, in this case from August 1933. The title is Rough and Perfect, and I hope you enjoy it. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation, From the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. The rough ashlar and the trestle board seem to have been symbols in ancient craft masonry at least from the beginning of the Grand Lodge period in 1717. They are illustrated on the earliest of the old tracing boards which have come down to us. Just when or how the perfect ashlar came into our symbolism is another matter, and not as simple as it appears. In 1731, one Samuel Pritchard who denominated himself as a life member of a constituted lodge, wrote and published Masonry Dissected, the first of a long series of exposés of Freemasonry. In it is this curious dialogue, purporting to be held between the entered apprentice during his initiation and some initiating officer. Question. Question. Have, you Have you any, any jewels, jewels in your, in your lodge? lodge? Answer. Answer. Yes. yes. Question. Question. How, How many? many? Answer. Answer. Six. Six. Three, three movable and three, three immovable. Question. Question. What, what are, are the movable jewels? jewels? Answer. Answer. Square, Square level, level and plumb rule. Question. Question. What, what are their uses? uses? Answer. Answer. Square, Square to down, down true and, and right lines. lines. Level, level to try all, all horizontals. horizontals and plumb rule to try all uprights. Question. What are the immovable jewels? Answer. Tassel board, rough ashlar, and broached thernal. Question. What are their uses? Answer. A tassel board for the master to draw his designs upon, rough ashlar for the fellow craft to try their jewels upon, and the broached thernal for the entered apprentice, apprentice to learn to work, to work upon. upon. The learned Dr. Oliver, most prolific of the early writers on Freemasonry, to whose industry, if not to whose accuracy, Freemasonry owes a great debt, unwittingly muddied the waters of antiquity in which this broached thernal was apparently immersed. He confused it with the rough ashlar, stating that the, that the two were the same. Old tracing boards of the entered apprentice degree disclose what we readily recognise as the trestle board, although in those days it was known as a tassel. Adjacent to it is what is plainly a rough ashlar. Immediately next is a drawing of a cube surmounted by a pyramid. A cubical stone with a pyramidal apex. Early French tracing boards display the Pierre Cubique, of cubical stone. Modern tracing boards show the perfect ashlar, not the rough ashlar as Oliver had it, in place of the broached thernal, or cubical stone with pyramid atop. Mackey quotes Parker's glossary of the terms in architecture as follows. Broach, broach or broche, broche is, an is an old English, English term, term for spire, spire. Still, still in use in Leicestershire, Leicestershire where it is said to denote a spire street springing from the tower without any intervening parapet. Thernal is from the old French tournel, a turret or little tower. The broached thernal then was the spired turret. It was a model on which apprentices might learn the principles of their art because it presented to them, in its various outlines, the forms of the square and the triangle the cube, cube and, and the pyramid. pyramid. Modern authorities dispute this. G.W. Speth finds that brooch 
in Scotland means to rough hew. Thernal, he states, is a chisel with which to rough hew, rather than a model of a spired turret on which an apprentice might learn to work. But, he inquires, what then becomes of the pyramid on the cube displayed on the old tracing boards? Moreover, the Scotch use boast as an alternate word for brooch, and boasted ashlar can be found in modern dictionaries, meaning chiselled with an irregular surface. As a matter of fact, no one really knows just what our ancient brethren meant by broached thernal. What we do know is that somewhere in the early formative period of the modern ritual, broached thernal gave way to perfect ashlar. But it did not necessarily do so because of the presence on the tracing board of a rough ashlar. No less an authority than R. W. Charles C. Hunt, librarian and Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Ar Iowa, presents the perpend ashlar as its probable progenitor. A perpend ashlar, the word has many variations, such as parpen, parpend, parpent, parpine, parpen, parping, is a dressed stone which passes completely through a wall from one side to the other having two smooth vertical faces. This perpen stone, or bonda, or bond stone, is the same as the parping ashlar of Gloucestershire, a stone which passes through a wall and shows a fair face on either side. In the true Masonic chart, published by R. W. Jeremy L. Cross in 1820, appear pictures of the rough and perfect ashlars, showing them substantially as we know them today. It is noteworthy that the stones illustrated are more than twice as long as wide and high, which seems to bear out the idea that the perfect ashlar, at least, was once the perpend ashlar. Before examining the symbolism of the ashlars, it is illuminating to read at least one passage from the great light. And the and king, king commanded, commanded and they, and they brought, brought great, great stones, stones, and costly, costly stones, stones, and huge stones, 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 to lay the foundation of the house. And Solomon's, Solomon's builders, builders and Hiram's builders, builders did hew them, them, and the stone squares. So, so they, prepared they prepared timber and stones to build the house. There is a distinction between builders and stone squarers. While those who cut and squared the stone, and those who built, both hewed, yet they were distinct in functions. It is also interesting to observe the classification of great, costly, and hued. Great, of course, refers to size. The larger the stone, the harder it was to cut from the quarry, the more difficult to transport, and therefore the more expensive. But costly may also refer to the expense of hewing. Then, as now, the more truly and carefully a stone was hewed and smoothed, squared and polished, the more time was required, and therefore the more costly the stone became. Few symbols seem more obvious, at least in their simpler aspects. Rough ashlar, man in his untutored state. Perfect ashlar, man educated, refined, with mind filled with light. It is this symbolism which Brother J. W. Lawrence evidently had in mind when he wrote, The perfect, perfect ashlar, ashlar as a symbol, symbol is the summum bonum of, of Freemasonry. Freemasonry. That, is that is to say, to say everything, everything else in Freemasonry, Freemasonry leads, leads up, up to it. it. The, the volume of the sacred law describes it. it. The chequered pavement illustrates it. it. The great, great architect, architect, no less than the grand geometrician, desire it and we are satisfied with nothing less. When the craft has fashioned the perfect ashlar, it has nothing else to do. With part of which all can agree. If some think there yet remains the building to be done after the ashlars are hewn to perfection, we may still make our own the thought that the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge above wants only perfection in the spiritual stones for the house not made with hands. 
but the symbolism can be carried further. In, in this subject, Introduction to Freemasonry reads, The common, common gavel, gavel, which breaks, which breaks off, off the corners, corners of rough, rough stones, stones, the better to fit better them for the builder's use, joins, joins the rough, rough and perfect ashlars in a hidden, a hidden symbol, symbol of the order, order at once, once beautiful, beautiful and tender. And tender. The famous, famous sculptor, sculptor and ardent, ardent Freemason, Freemason Gutzen Borglum, when asked how he carved stone, stone into beautiful statues, statues once said, It is very simple. simple. I merely knock away with a hammer and chisel the stone I do not need, and the statue is there. It was there all of the time. In the great light we read, The kingdom of heaven is within you. We are also there taught that man is made in the image of God. As Brother Borglum has so beautifully said, images are made by a process of taking away. The perfection is already within. All that is required is to remove the roughness and excrescences, divesting our hearts and consciences of the vices and superfluities of life, to show forth the perfect man and mason within. Albert Pike, always original, thought the interpretation of the rough and perfect ashlars as given in our ancient craft monitors and ritualistic instruction to be superficial. He found another meaning. The rough ashlar is the people, as a mass, rude and unorganised. The perfect ashlar, a cubical stone, symbol of perfection, is the state. The rulers, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed, the constitution and laws, speaking the will of the people. The government, harmonious, symmetrical, efficient, its powers properly distributed and duly adjusted in equilibrium. Any brother is privileged to extend symbolism in new directions as far as he wishes. If his reading of a symbol is to him satisfactory teaching of a truth, it is a good reading. But the rough and perfect ashlars are sufficiently inclusive of the many truths within the grasp of the average individual, without extending the interpretation to such vast conceptions as the people and the state. Even Pike, great interpreter of symbols though he was, never contended that the original symbolism of the Ashlars, as developed from operative practice by the early speculatives, was of a political nature. Hunt's reading of the perfect Ashlar as the successor of the Perpend Ashlar, is most beautiful. In Some Thoughts on Masonic Symbolism, he suggests, We call it the perfect Ashlar, but we must remember that it is perfected only because it is completely adapted to the purpose for which it was made, namely, to exactly fit into its place in the building and act as a binder for other stones. In order that it may do this, it must, it must possess, possess certain, certain attributes, attributes, and through, and through these the attributes, attributes we are reminded, reminded of that state of perfection at which we hope to arrive by a virtuous education, education our own endeavours, and the blessing of God. It has, it has two faces to be exposed, to be exposed and, both and both must be absolutely, absolutely upright. upright. It does, it does not, not have, have one standard for the world and another for the home. The same, same face, face, square and true, is presented, presented both, both to, the to the world and the lodge, and it, and it teaches, it teaches that, we that we should not have, have one code of morals for one place and another for another, but that the right is the same wherever we are and under whatever circumstances we may be placed. The making of a perfect ashlar from a rough ashlar requires skill, tools and a plan. Without any of the three, the ashlar cannot be made perfect. Skills to use the tools means education to wield chisel and mallet. Education to use the talents God gave us in whatever walk of life we may be called. Tools must the workman have, for empty hands cannot chip away hard stone. Tools must the speculative craftsman have, for an empty mind cannot wear away 
the resistance of our complicated life. Speculative tools are honour and probity, energy and resource, courage and common sense and like virtues, the generation of which forms character. Most especially must the operative workman have a plan with which to hew. His mind must see both dimension and form, otherwise his tools will cut aimlessly and his ashlar will be askew, not square, fit only for the waste pile or the curiosity shop. So must the speculative workman have a plan to which to fit his perfect ashlar of character, an ambition, a goal for which to strive, some hope in the future towards which he can stretch eager hands, bending every energy to accomplish. Considered thus, the rough and perfect ashlars become symbols of greater interest than appears only on a casual inspection. One interpretation is, perhaps, as satisfactory as another. It is one of the great beauties of symbolism that interpretations can differ widely and yet all be true and all fit with each other. As one writer puts it, most, Most symbols, symbols have many interpretations. interpretations. These, These do not, do not contradict, contradict, but amplify each other. Each other. Thus, Thus the square, the square is, is a symbol of perfection, perfection, of honour and honesty, of good, of good work. work. These, These are, are all different, different and yet allied. allied. The, square the square is not, is not a symbol of wrong, or evil, or meanness, or disease. Or disease. Ten, ten different, different men, men may read, read ten, ten different, different meanings into a square, and yet each meaning fits with, and belongs to, the other meanings. All these meanings are right. When all men know all the meanings, the need for Freemasonry will have passed away. Read the symbolism of the Ashlars as we choose, from the simplest conception to the most profound. The thought remains, even as the cornerstone of a temple must be a perfect ashlar, so are these symbols cornerstones of our speculative science. The more beautiful and important that the learned men have found in them so many and such beautiful lessons. For more Masonic podcasts, videos, music, texts and artwork, visit fromthequarries.com or subscribe to our YouTube, Twitter and Facebook accounts by searching From the Quarries.